Section 22 of Birds and Nature Volume 12 Number 1 June 1902 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Isaiah Barker of Binghamton, New York. Tobacco. Nicotiana tabacum L. Pernicious weed, who scent the fair noise, unfriendly to society's chief joys. The worst effect is banishing for hours the sex whose presence civilizes ours. Thou art indeed the drug a gardener wants to poison vermin that infest his plants. Cowper, Conversation, Line 251 The tobacco plant is a tall herbaceous annual, with large, simple leaves and terminal inflorescence, belonging to the nightshade family, Solanaceae, the members of which resemble each other in that they are more or less poisonous, and in that they have a disagreeable, nauseous, heavy odor. There are several species of tobacco, of which the above is the most highly valued, and they are all natives of warm countries, such as Southern Asia, India, South America, and the West Indies. Tobacco is very extensively cultivated in nearly all warm countries, especially in the Southern United States and the West Indies. The history of the cultivation and use of tobacco is shrouded in uncertainty. Some authorities affirm that it was extensively used for smoking and as snuff and cultivated on a large scale in China, many centuries before the discovery of America. Mayan, the botanist, in studying ancient Chinese sculptures, noticed the same form of pipe in use at the present time. Even if this be true, and the statement is questioned by other authorities, the fact nevertheless remains that tobacco was unknown to Europeans until after the discovery of America. Columbus found that the natives of the West Indies smoked cylindrical rolls of tobacco leaves wrapped in maize leaf, to which the name tobacco was applied. This name was also given to the tobacco tubes used by the ancient Mexicans. That tobacco was employed since the remotest antiquity by the natives of the Western continent, from South America to Canada, has been satisfactorily proven from the examination of burial mounds. In 1492, the natives of Cuba used tobacco for smoking, both as a narcotic stimulant and to drive away mosquitoes, as snuff, and as a medicine. The monk Romano Pane, a companion of Columbus, gave the first description of the plant. Gonzalo Hernández de Oviedo was the first to bring seeds to Spain where tobacco was cultivated as an ornamental plant until Niccolo Monardes began to extol its medicinal virtues. Soon thereafter it began to be used for smoking and a snuff. Shakespeare makes no reference to the use of tobacco, though it was well known in England during this time. The price was very high, and it was used in small quantities by the rich only. The pipes used for smoking tobacco were very small, and are known to antiquaries as elfin pipes. The smoke was expelled through the nostrils and not the mouth, as this produced the most pronounced narcotic effect. It seems that from the very first, strong efforts were made to prevent the use of tobacco, excepting as a medicine. Popes Urban VIII and Innocent XI issued bans without effect. Priests and the sultans of Turkey declared smoking a crime, Sultan Amurat IV decreeing its punishment by the most horrible death. In Russia during the earlier part of the 17th century, the noses of smokers were cut off. King James I of England issued a counterblast to tobacco, in which he described its use as a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs and in the black, stinking fume thereof nearly resembling the horrible Stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless, to which all users of the weed are condemned. All opposition was of no avail, 
and the use of tobacco has increased steadily up to the present time, and is still on the increase in spite of all boasted civilized progress. Turks and Persians are the greatest smokers in the world. In India, all classes and both sexes smoke, likewise in China and Japan. When it was found that even the most cruel death penalty did not prohibit, efforts were made to check its use, and to this effect some ridiculous laws were made. For example, according to a Puritan Blue Law, it was a criminal offense to smoke within ten miles of any habitation. Yet it will be recalled that tobacco was extensively cultivated in the colonies, and history informs us that England sent shiploads of fair maidens to America to be bartered for it with tobacco leaves. Each eligible Puritan planter had the privilege of choosing a maiden who became his property in exchange for from forty to as much as ninety pounds of good tobacco. This barter is referred to in the opening chapters of that interesting novel, To Have and to Hold, by Mary Johnston. Historically, it is stated that Francis Drake and Sir Walter Raleigh, the gallant favorite of Queen Bess, introduced the custom of smoking into England. One day a servant, on entering the study in which Sir Walter was quietly smoking, believing his master on fire, rushed forward and dashed a bowl of water over him. It is also stated that Sir Raleigh made a wager that he could give the weight of the smoke made from a pipe full of tobacco. He carefully weighed the tobacco before putting it in the pipe, smoked it, and then weighed the ash. The difference, he said, was the weight of the escaped smoke. The wager, however, was not justly won, as Raleigh did not take into account the oxygen of the air which entered into chemical union during the smoke formation. Tobacco requires rich soil and careful cultivation. The seed is sown in a hotbed or in a sheltered place in the open. The plants are set from April to June. The ground is carefully tilled, free from weeds, and the plants are watched for cutworm and the big green tobacco worm, which are very destructive. Worms and eggs must be removed and destroyed. To increase the size of the leaves and hasten maturity, the flowering tops are broken off. When the leaves are matured, which is indicated by a yellowish mottling, the plants are cut off close to the ground, fastened in groups of six to eight, and dried. Drying must be done carefully, as upon this depends the aroma of the tobacco. The leaves are also taken from the stalks and dried. In either case, they undergo a sweating process, which must be carefully regulated. According to recent observation, the sweating process which develops the aroma, is initiated by microbes, and that the special aroma of each brand or culture variety of tobacco is the result of the action of a certain species of microbe. German scientists have succeeded in developing the flavor or aroma of Havana tobacco in tobacco raised in Germany by adding the sweating microbe of Havana tobacco. Further experiments in this line are in progress. At the present time, tobacco is cultivated on an enormous scale, the United States producing more than all European countries put together. Southern England is well suited for tobacco growing, but since 1660 it has been unlawful to grow tobacco for use because of a statute then passed in favor of the American colonies, which law, remarkably enough, has not been repealed. The West Indies produce enormous quantities of highly prized tobacco. The Havana tobacco, and cigars having a worldwide fame for delicacy of aroma. Tobacco is prepared for use in various ways. The leaves are more or less finely cut for smoking, powdered for snuff, pressed into various forms for chewing, and rolled into cylinders for smoking. The leaves may be used pure, or flavored with different substances, such as licorice, syrup, and molasses. Tobacco was also extensively adulterated with other leaves, such as cabbage, cherry, peach, carrot, beet, etc. The very poor employ various substitutes, as red clover heads, dried corn silk, various leaves, even finely cut hay. Enterprising boys may be seen smoking dried cornstalk pith, twigs of the grapevine, and other porous plant branches. The price of crude tobacco and prepared tobacco varies greatly, 
depending on the quality, judged by the delicacy of the aroma, the quality of the leaf, and the manner of preparation. Some flavors are not the result of the sweating or curing processes, nor yet due to the quality or variety of the tobacco, but to foreign substances added or to the modification of the curing method. The peculiar flavor of the so-called Latakia tobacco is due to the smoke made of the wood of a pine, Pinus haloponensis, to which it is exposed for several months. This tobacco is said to consist largely or wholly of the flowering tops and even the seed-bearing capsules. In the manufacture of cigars and better grades of smoking and chewing tobacco, the mid-ribs are removed, but are not thrown away, but generally added to the cheaper grades of smoking tobacco and snuff tobacco. Crude as well as prepared tobacco is subject to deterioration after curing. For example, Havana cigars pronounced of excellent quality on leaving the factory will deteriorate in flavor and aroma after having been stored for some time. This is supposed to be due to the development of a microbe producing a different aroma. No substance, whether animal, vegetable, or mineral, has been the cause of so much discussion and variation of opinion as to its utility as tobacco. As one extreme may be mentioned, an eminent older botanist who questioned the desirability of the discovery of America by Columbus because, as a result, was introduced into the civilized world this poisonous weed. Others, again, cannot find words suitable to laud its virtues, considering it a plant especially created for the benefit and pleasure of man, without which life would be dull and profitless. Similar differences of opinion exist today. To get a reliable opinion on the value of tobacco, one must not take the fanatical rantings of those who believe every crime is to be laid to the use of tobacco, nor yet the addle-brained vaporings of those whose systems have been for years steeped in nicotine and the oil of tobacco. As an example of the latter may be cited Kipling's poem, To My Lady Nicotine. The use of tobacco may be summarized as follows. Tobacco contains a very powerful poison, nicotine, named after Jean Nicot, the French ambassador to Spain, who was instrumental in introducing the plant to Spain and France. Further, it contains oil and odoriferous, volatile substances. To one not accustomed to the use of tobacco, even very minute doses of nicotine, 1 to 7 grams, produces severe symptoms of poisoning, accompanied by very depressing nausea, vomiting, feeble pulse, muscular weakness, extreme pallor, and cold sweat. In brief, there is an all-gone feeling. As a rule, the system recovers quite rapidly from the awful depression. A tolerance to the effects of tobacco is readily established, as all who are addicted to its use can testify. I have seen a tobacco chewer swallow the entire quid without any noticeable ill effects. All unprejudiced authorities are agreed that the habitual use of tobacco acts injuriously upon the system no matter in what form or manner it is used. That is, during the combustion, the nicotine is changed chemically. But it is nevertheless true that there are more or less poisonous gaseous compounds in the smoke. Not only is the tobacco habit injurious to the system, but it is also nasty and filthy. The tobacco stench not only permeates the clothing, but also the entire system, the breath and the atmosphere about the users of tobacco. While all tobacco habits are filthy, there are degrees of filthiness. Snuff dipping, which is extensively practiced by men and women of the poorer classes of the South, is unquestionably the most filthy habit. A stick moistened with saliva is dipped into snuff tobacco and rubbed on gums, teeth, and tongue. Next in filthiness is the old fashion of putting snuff into the nostrils, a habit which we are pleased to note is rapidly dying out. Next follows the chewing habit, which is very extensively practiced by laborers, with whom smoking is inconvenient or forbidden, as sailors. I remember an inveterate user of tobacco who smoked and chewed at the same time. He kept a quid in his mouth during meals and took a big mouthful just before retiring. The breath of tobacco chewers is sickening, and the discolored teeth and tobacco-stained mustache and beard is disgusting to behold to say nothing of the filthy expectoration. Of the various forms of smoking, the cigarette habit is the most disgusting and the most injurious. 
cigarettes are extensively smoked by young boys, and those who continue on a large scale become physical and mental weaklings and criminals. Pipe smoking, as already indicated, dates back to remotest antiquity. Pipes with short stems are more injurious because more poisonous volatile substances are inhaled. The long-stemmed pipes of German students are less injurious. In a short time, the bowl of the pipe becomes saturated with tobacco oil and emits a horrible stench. Cigar smoking is usually considered less vulgar and less disgusting than smoking a pipe, but there is certainly nothing more disagreeable to the nostrils than the conglomerate stench of a poor cigar. The well-diluted aroma from a good cigar is very pleasant at a distance. The injurious effects resulting from the continued habitual use of tobacco may be summarized as follows. If the habit has begun very early in life, five to ten years, the mental, moral, and physical development is checked or stunted. At all times the habit is apt to produce chronic dyspepsia. The heart's action is weakened. There will be palpitation, irregularity of beat, and sooner or later there is fatty degeneration. That is, there are a series of changes in the heart designated as tobacco heart. Those with tobacco heart cannot undergo the usual hardships, and they are more apt to succumb to disease. The optic nerve and retina are acted upon, producing weakness and dimness of vision known as tobacco amblylopia, which may result in total blindness. The mental powers are lessened. There will develop various neuroses, twitchings, tremblings of hands, etc. One of the most common results is smoker's sore throat, which cannot be cured unless the use of tobacco is discontinued. Medicinally, tobacco is but rarely used now. With non-smokers, it is useful to relieve asthma. Formerly, it was quite extensively employed in spasmodic affections and in parasitic skin diseases. Tobacco will be excluded from the next issue of United States Pharmacopoeia. A few words in regard to anti-tobacco and anti-cigarette crusades. They are too generally conducted by those who in their efforts approach the fanatical, and who are greatly lacking in scientific learning, and who therefore cannot present the subject in a rational and effective manner. If parents will set a good example, and teach the true, injurious effects of tobacco and tobacco habits to their sons and daughters, they will in all probability not be tempted to use tobacco. All children need careful watching by intelligent parents in order to keep them from acquiring bad habits. This does not apply more nor less to a possible acquisition of the tobacco habit than to any other habit. An illly fed, neglected boy who was allowed to roam the streets and gutters, who chooses his own companions, and who never receives any good advice or kind words from anyone, will very likely learn to smoke, besides acquiring other bad habits. Albert Schneider End of section 22 This recording is in the public domain. Section 23 of Birds and Nature, Volume 12, Number 1, June 1902 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson among the beautiful pictures that hang on memory's wall is one of a dim old forest that seemeth the best of all. Alice Carey. End of section 23. This recording is in the public domain. End of Birds and Nature, volume 12, number 1, June 1902.